Okay, we're recording. Um, welcome everyone. This is Jerry O'Neill from the West Awake. It's my second video in the series of um, podcasts that I've been doing over the last month. I'm going to just add a bit more um, video content. I'm delighted today to have um, Thomas Sheridan. Artist, writer, philosopher, you name it, we'll get it, we'll get into all of that stuff with, with Thomas. He'll be familiar to many of you on um that follow me on the West Awake. Um but I suppose and Thomas's podcasts go out on Thomas Sheridan too on YouTube. He's got a huge following and a highly engaged following, and it's 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 an international following too. Um so where I wanted to start for maybe the people that might know too much about your background, Thomas, is this, you 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 were born and raised out of the Ballymun Flats in Dublin. And I, I, I think it's fascinating maybe to start there because like, you know, that was a symbol of, eight, you know, RT news on the 80s, the, 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 the go-to stock photo was the picture of the towers in the, Ballym in the Ballymun area there. So maybe we might just start there. Well, I was actually born in the Rotundra Hospital in Parnell Square, so I'm basically as set in Dublin as you can get. I initially lived for a few years in, uh, as a growing up as a little kid, in uh, the tenements in Ben Burp Street on the north side of Dublin near Collins Barracks. And they were like so many people who grew up in tenements back then or moved out to new housing in Ballymun. And so most of my childhood memories was growing up in Shangan Avenue and the Ballymun Flats. And we also live in Thomas Clark Tower for a while as well. Uh, yes, I mean, that was basically a very interesting, I'm very, like I wouldn't say I'm one of these people that proud of where I came from or anything like that, mm -hmm. because you're, that, that, you know, that, you're, that's an accident of beer. That's, you know, that kind yeah, of yeah. thing. But I'm grateful that I did grow up there because it, it made me grow up incredibly fast. There was no, it, yes, it was, you know, a lot of negative stuff about it were true. Yes, it was violent. I used to get beat up nearly every day coming and going to and from school, you know. Yes, it was, at, towards the end, became very bad in terms of social degradation. I mean, the place was basically like Fallujah towards the end, and you'd be stepping over junkies dying on the, on the steps while you were going to school and stuff like that, and there'd be syringes on the flats and it was basically run by gangs but at the same time too it was full of experience and full of a lot of wonderfully decent people also there was a tremendous sense of anarchy there and I, the police were afraid to go in a lot of times well they would never leave the police station so there was an element of it, it policed itself now there was two elements of that there was gangs there was the ira and then there was also people who just took it upon themselves to look after others. So if something like happened, like your bike was stolen, instead of going to the guard or the cops and saying they took my bike, you would just knock on the door of the local texter and he would go down and nicely say to the family, they stuck the kid's bike to make him get it back from. So there's a tremendous freedom in that and a, a remarkable level of freedom. So from a very early age, without knowing the term or understanding what it was, I realized what anarchy is. Now, anarchy is basically faith in the human person, in human decency. That at the end of the day, despite all the things that people in Ballymore were inflicted with, the stigmas, we were called names, we were, you know, I can remember RT coming out there interviewing the kids and asking us, what is life like out here? And I said, well, hey, I play in a band. You know, we do, we do all kinds of things. We have an art club, we have a, a for hoagie club, we do it all. And uh, the RT News, where that was, was today, tonight, whatever magazine program that night talked about, these kids are hopeless and on the edge of society, and their lives are basically nothing but misery and woe ahead of them. And that was like completely different than what we were asked to say. So right now, from a very early age, I knew the media was an absolute joke in terms of how it reported things. It actually editorialized. It didn't, it didn't, it, it, like I said, it was a great education. It editorialized mm -hmm. things. So all very early age i knew that when i was reading a newspaper report or watching a tv report what i was getting was not news i was getting editorials so mm. then uh, i did one year in kevin street after I finished my leaving cert and uh, studying electronic engineering was terribly unhappy there mainly because and this is completely true the class system 
I was constantly put down and looked upon because I came from the Valley One Flats. Normally, my fellows with default accent who were also involved in student politics, which were generally socialist. So then, I, from a very early age, I knew exactly what the socialist thing was and the so-called left-wing thing. And I got fed up with that. Uh, wanted to, really wanted to play music. Went off to New York. Had a fantastic few years. Played in a band. Basically, my dream came true. But what I wanted to attain in that. Went to college again at night and studied graphic design. Ended up in Wall Street of all places. And by the time I was through my early thirties, I went from the Ballymont flat to be a communications and graphics consultant for Goldman Sachs in their international banking division. How that happened was basically I was good at language, and a lot of that had to do. I was very. I'm, I'm a classic self-educated person. I was always that kid who was reading the books and I had an interest in everything from satire to literature to poetry to psychology, serial killers. That's how I got interest in psychopathy <laughs> and uh, the occult. You name it, I was involved in a lot of those kinds of things. And then about two, I moved back to Ireland uh, after I got fed up with all that. And I moved to Sligo, and then I had a large business for a while. It collapsed when the 2008 economic crisis came in. And then I said to myself, I'm going to write that book about my experience on Wall Street, about the psychopathy of these institutions. But before I get there, I want to say most people that work in Wall Street are very decent, fine people. They're just trying to look after their families. However, the psychopaths were on the show, and that was very apparent to me because I was reading books on serial killers like Ted Bundy, and I'd read the book. And then I'd read the profile of Ted Bundy and then look up the manager. <laughs> so that's where puzzling people came on. It gave me a name, it gave me a career as an alternative kind of person. And since then, I've written about, I don't know, six or seven books on the topic ranging from uh, the occult history of the Third Reich to uh, the occult and Freemasonry and other things like that. Another book on psychopathy and a book on social engineering and control. And a few other things like I'm very interested in ancient sites like the Round Towers of Ireland and the ancient Eglis of the country and the world as a whole. So it's given me a very broad, holistic audience as well as a very, that are also interested in the things I'm interested in. So I, my audience is incredibly diverse, mainly because they've come to me over the years from different angles. But ironically, it, would, it took the, the Rona, the whole thing with the Rona and the lockdowns and everything to realize that why we were all together, we were like a tribe waiting for this moment. That uh, uh, despite what the specific interest, some might be only interested in my megalithic work, some might be only in my occult work, or my psychopathy work, but we all got to came together like that. It, it was almost like uh, osmosis and organic. This is evil. We're at war, and it's a spiritual warfare. And that's how I started making these videos called the. Uh, the the Rona Chronicles and invented all these terms to try and get around the YouTube algorithms like Needlecraft and Windows Zero and Foghorn Leghorn. And mm -hmm. it's incredibly empowering because we've created a kind of a vernacular that's like hobo language. And it's like uh, we've managed to, it, it proves that you can live in a parallel society. And a big part of that is what I learned that got me into the communication department in Wall Street. It's how you use language because science mm -hmm. is, is a science of language. And if you can change your language and how you phrase and think, especially automatic impulses that have been put into you by media, you can literally change the nature of the reality around you. And the, the dynamic of oppression, suppression, peers, subordinates can instantly change on just the removal of a certain word or, or, or type of syntax. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's right. The... That's right. That's right. I say that probably in all my work, that's probably been my main contribution to is I've, I've helped people shift their focus and how they think about things. And I think it's given a lot of empowerment to both me and these people who picked up on it as well. That's, so, that's basically what I say I'm, I've done. If I was to say, if anyone was to ask me, that's what my thing is. I'm, I help people use language in order to defend themselves. Absolutely. You've look. There's, you've gone through a powerful amount of stuff there, and uh, a few trigger points in my head. There is, um, you know, the, the well. Let's start here. When did you? When was the time when you noticed about yourself that you had this kind of unique ability to look at the world in a way that others weren't, and? Was that something you noticed about yourself as a young as a young man, or was it 
were you kind of searching around in the dark saying bumping into things or it seems to me like you at a very young age you understood like when you mentioned that thing about the media there you know most of us took 40 something years to figure out the worst of it and you seem to have seen it pretty clearly early in your life well the great tragedy the great tragedy there is that many of my friends felt the same way too but a lot of them died young a lot of them died of drugs or got involved in crime and stuff like that it's almost like the, the whole thing was designed to get rid of the, the best of the smartest thinkers somehow it's also like I've, I've known so many people who are heroin addicts who are just geniuses yeah and yeah. it was and, and it was and i've never met, i don't think i've ever met a heroin addict who was an idiot they don't have the same problems that like people with alcohol or we have they are definitely far more sentient and aware they never seem to lose that sharpness of mind and sadly they seem to be the ones who are drawn in by this 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 substance but anyway yeah uh, myself um i was about four years old i was writing my first <laughs> sentence and uh you know the way they used to have when you were teaching upper and lowercase they have a blackboard that had two lines and uh, for uppercase and two middle lines and red for lowercase yeah. i'm going back it was, it was the early <laughs> 70s okay. yeah, keep going. And, I, and i was and i was yeah, i was draw you draw the b and you, you know, and you, so the, it was it was an initial case sentence look the train is coming and i wrote down the contain i had no trouble with it because i was already reading by that stage uh mm -hmm. so came over and said that's very good Thomas uh, you did excellent then good good lad and I was like you know <laughs> I, was, I think that night I was reading a book on the Russian uh, revolution <laughs> so I don't understand I don't know what that, I don't know where that came from it must have been reincarnation yeah. or something but um uh I changed the L to a B book the train is coming and uh the teacher looked at me and says, why did you change the L to a T? Well, we see the train coming and now we got a book a ticket. And she looked at me like, she went quiet for a second and looked at me and go, you're going to be a very dangerous boy when you grow up. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Um, but, but it's very interesting, Thomas, because in when, when you're, just what you were saying there is because when we had the event in Shum and you came down and were kind enough to come down and speak at it, I had um, and you you were kind of saying the 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 different p types of people that follow you. I had a guy who who did me a massive favor that came down from the northeast of the country who had a PhD in agriculture, and his mother was sick and all that, and he says I might only be able to stay for the first half, and I says no problem. Look, you just do your piece. You can toddle off when you're finished and then we we did our piece with the journalism and then he saw that you were there and he was like oh i have to stay i i, I need to get a selfie with thomas and i thought in my own mind i says isn't that amazing now you've got a guy with a phd here who's um following you know you your thought trains on the way the world works and it it struck me as that you know people there's a thirst for what you're saying out there and it's across a wide spectrum of people yeah i've been very fortunate that way again i it's again probably a reflection of a life story growing up in the ghetto and ending yeah. up quite well and then ending then, then leaving all that to become a kind of an alternative person mm -hmm. so i guess you know it's life experience is a tremendous thing i think that's what's wrong with a lot of people today is they fundamentally lack life experience and they think they know mm -hmm. it all because they follow the processes of the system so when the system actually lets them down they're incapable of actually adapting i find that that's a, a big problem with people today is the fact that there's a lack of life experience i'm very chuffed that people with like advanced degrees actually take an interest in my work because they're usually the ones who are most brainwashed of all you mm -hmm. know because they reach that level of a phd even though you have to do your own projects and everything it is about ultimately repeating what you've been told by your your, your leadership this is why so many people at phd end up in flying saucer cults you read jack the lady <laughs> messages of deception he shows how the the heaven's gate cult was actually uh, derived out of the uh, uh, massachusetts institute of technology and caltech scientists who ended up wanting to go to the talk of flying saucer men you know, this is because the, the cult leader in the 
in the cult would just replace the the professor in the college. This I have to be told what to do and think, and that's you know this was identified a long time ago, and this is why they this is why today you know when I was growing up it was very it was almost to get to university was something rich kids did you know. Well, that's what I was just going to say to you. Getting to leave and search. Yeah. Yeah, Getting to exactly. leave insert from where you were was not a was not a an easy journey. I'd imagine, like in comparison to, I think I read somewhere recently. You know, in the west of Ireland, Galway and Mayo have a history. Our, my parents' generation had a very strong sense that the only way out was an education. So, you what you often find with Galway and Mayo people my age, they're one of the highest. Uh, they would have been one of the highest counties for university participation per head of population back in the nineties, because of that kind of feeling. But it would have been a very different scenario from where you came. Like you came from, I would have said, was it? Well, what your parents were saying was uh, what they believed in was a very honourable thing. You know, the history of the famine and the land leagues and all that stuff. Those memories were deeply entrenched in people in the west of Ireland, and mm -hmm. there was absolutely a very honourable thing to want to put your children to university. Or it wasn't a selfish thing; it was basically they you did not ever want to see them or to go through what their grandparents say went through. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. But the world is a different place these days; things have changed tremendously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, <laughs> yeah. they but I can tell you for a fact: for me, it was the class system. You know, go, and that's absolutely true that people in Ballymun used to have to give their cousins a dress in a different part of the neighborhood or mm -hmm. their girlfriend's dress in the country or somewhere in order yeah, to yeah. apply for a job. And uh, I can tell you for a fact that the, I, I learned at a very early age the so called groups that claim to represent the working class, like the Labour Party and the trade union movement, were incredibly middle class and incredibly bigoted towards people that came from the lower end of society. We're only interested mm -hmm. in civil servants and and, you know, people who were, it, it worked in, you know, got jobs in CIE. And remember, those places like CIE were tremendous nepotism in those days. You basically, mm -hmm. I remember going down to a careers a careers thing back when I was a kid. And the form in the CIE play, the CIE booth actually said, name a relative you have who already works in CIE. This is the kind of, it was all a terrible lock lock in Ireland back then. But yeah, so education was the way out because like if you didn't have, your family didn't have any means to get into the unions or something. This is why I have a hatred of unions to this day. Uh, that was the way out, education or uh, emigration. And both are honorable, mm -hmm. by the way. I, I, I know, but for me, it was emigration, I guess, ultimately in the end. But not out of desperation. I had a job here. I mean, it wasn't much, but I was like, I didn't know. I mean, I had a, I had a, I had a good life when I left mm -hmm. Ireland. I was financially independent. I had a girlfriend. I did all the normal things. But it's just I wanted to spread my wings. I mean, you know, we live on an island, and it's only natural, I think, we want to actually see the world. And so it was mm -hmm. part of that. But, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the education thing was definitely an honourable thing back then. But for me, there was, there was no chance of going to university. It didn't exist. I can remember them taking these Bally used to be surrounded by lots of factories, and they took us to this place called Samba Fipe, which was used to make, they were used to make metal fittings, high, like for engineering. And the school teacher saying, like, uh, well, this we don't have to insert this way you'll end up. This kind of this no mm -hmm. intercert, right? Your junior your junior cert, this is where you'll end up. You know, it was, it, you were you were told from a, a, an early age that the, the 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 world there was a demarcation line around your life and uh, you were not to move beyond that demarcation line. And it was just it was basically driven by elitism and snobbery snobbery. And the same people, ironically, are still doing it to me today. They just use terms like far right. They just use terms like <laughs> that, conspiracy theorists. But it's just they're the same class of people from the same families, from the same elitist snob mindsets, trying to uh, trying to hold, hold people like a back. Not just me, you, anyone. And mm -hmm. it's, it's ultimately, you know, when you've been at the bottom of the class system, you're very aware yes. of it's like being a black person a black person has a different relationship with racism i had a, a very good friend of mine in new york a black guy called robert who was best friends with him for years he told me some fascinating stuff about that he said a black person has a different relationship with racism than a white person and i'll tell you how he says if i have a white girlfriend and i'm introduced to someone and they see a white girl my white girlfriend there's a pause there's a slight pause, this kind of thing. And yeah, and his actual words were, 
And that is like the, what that person is saying with that pause is, what the hell is she doing with him? And he said, mm -hmm. always, and he uses words, motherfuckers from money who are the worst. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I even had that expressed in, when I we used to hang out in Columbus Avenue and these bars up on the upper west side of Manhattan. And these would be like full of like, you know, uh, you know, the law and law, uh, Democratic Party voters, you know, liberal types, super liberal, you know, New York Times, Bill Troy's kind of thing. And they used to off, they, used to, they automatically made the assumption that me and him were a gay couple. Why? What would an Irish fellow and a black guy do, do, do in being friends? This is how <laughs> these people, these are the, the ones who throw the, the slurs at everyone else, are the biggest rapists of all. And what you're dealing with is projection because they're instinctual race. Now, the same thing applies to the class system. You know, it, 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 the subtle things there, like, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk about language. Like, I had to learn how to say my TH sounds because, you know, I just talk like this story. You know, like you grow up, people tell me, that's not going to get you anywhere in life because it automatically sees an onus on you to improve yourself as well as society to say, yeah. Uh, unless, as well as you say upon others, am I being a bit of a dick here judging this person? Because it's it's a symbiotic thing, you know. I am mm -hmm. myself. You give me the chance to win respect. This is what we don't. This is this is how you really survive in life. Young people, if you're watching this, that's the greatest. You can take that to the bank. Meet people halfway, and you'll have a good life. But yeah, um, yeah. don't expect anything for nothing. And uh, you would find that certain people, no matter how you improved yourself would always look down on you. And you'll get that. No, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure rural people from Ireland coming to Dublin get that. I'm sure I know Irish people going to other countries get that. There's a certain nuance that appears there that you go, ah, they're really judging you now. Yeah, yeah. And tell me, Thomas, I, I'm just to, to bring in, you know, the, 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 the New York era for you. It was the anarchy in your social situation a link to the punk rock scene that you kind of it seems that you were in that type of music that you got involved in, or, or were they connected? Well, I'd say it was mostly a love of music, really. A love of, all, I, I loved the bands at the time then. As, you know, this was the early days of like Susie and the Banshees and the Cure and Bauhaus and industrial music scenes. Sonic Youth were appearing in the scene. And I, I just, uh, it's only. Okay, no, sorry, we got caught there, but. Um, no, no. My end, it went down. Bit wetter today. Ah, yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, sure. You were just go, you were just kind of delving in there to your the music side of things. Well, I th that's it. the music thing in New York direct that absolutely came from a love of music. You know, I yeah. been fascinated. You know, like, and I wanted very much a music scene that didn't exist in Ireland at the time. Uh, I my pissed off John Waters, but I didn't like like Wall Press and. What this, the mainstream music scene in Ireland was promoting at the time, I thought it was still very kind of hippie and backward and a bit parochial. And there was musical changes happening around the world, with the exception of the Virgin Prunes, the notable and honourable exception of the Virgin Prunes. The Irish, and you know, of course, you too. The Irish music scene uh, was pretty much very pedestrian and very Rolling Stone American kind of emulating. And I, I didn't, that kind of music never interested me at all. I was much more interested in what was coming out of England and, and, and like underground scene in New York. So that's what I went in for. And yeah, I was I was introduced into the punk rock scene in New York by a guy called Eddie Luke, a Chinese guy, who I met at a gig one night somewhere and we became friends and we started a band. And it was a very uh, interesting time in New York. It was when the, the glory days of the kind of CBG's punk rock was ending, it was kind of gone. Hip hop had yet to start. And there was a thing called the Dark New York scene, what it's called now. There's like an album, there's albums and stuff about it. And uh, that was the scene I was in. It was sort of like a mixture of what we call goth. We didn't really have goth back then. Sort of like the new wave of British heavy metal mixed with kind of the industrial sounds of bands like the Swanee. Things like, it, it was a very eclectic thing. But it was all basically a dark scene. And by that I mean esoterically dark. Uh, very in, much interested in the literature of like... Uh, H.P. Lovecraft, novels like that, um, the horror movies, uh, dystopian sci-fi, conspiracy theory, a big deal was, among, was conspiracy theory. That's one before it was, that was considered naff. It was actually discourse for the sane and for healthy and normal people. It was considered that way. It was like a historical what if. 
and uh, things like uh, computer hacking, phone hacking, uh, chaos magic. That was a huge thing within the scene, chaos magic, and uh, stuff like that, Discordia. And so I was like, I was so happy. It was everything I ever wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. And so well, we used to sit around all the time. And these are people. Now it was also very diverse scene. It was it was very mixed racially, ethnically, and uh, uh, class wise. I mean, one of my friends in the band was dating a Rockefeller's daughter, you know, that kind of thing. And he was from like Long Island, and you know, there was fellas from the Bronx, and there was an Irish fellow, me and a few English people, and it was absolutely fantastic for the short time it existed. But yeah, my God, was it? Was it? Did it set me up on the right path in life? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And how did how did the Goldman Sachs how did you get snared into Goldman Sachs in that? When I, I, yeah, when I finished uh, doing my when I finished doing night courses in graphic design, I was working painting houses and doing installing alarm systems and things like that, like yeah. kind of like working, working on building sites and in pubs and everything, the regular jobs you do. And so I was, I was paying myself through at night to go through this. And when I was finished, I went to recruit. I didn't know how to get a job. So I went to a recruiting agency and she looked over my thing and she said, uh, I was expecting to go into advertising or something like that. And she said, uh, would you be interested in working on Wall Street in financial? Would you have anything against that? Said, no, this is good because the money's going to be fantastic. And she says to me like, oh, and she looked at my portfolio and she says, well, have you done anything else with your life? And I said, well, I spent the last few years in the sort of underground industrial goth scene in Manhattan. <laughs> and she goes, you, yeah, you'll definitely get the job. And I says, what? And she goes, they're looking for people who can think, think differently and think outside the box because they're very, these people are not very good with language and ideas and concepts. So I was perfect for that, really. I would go into a place, I go into like the first, my first book job was in Goldman Sachs, I think it was Chase Manhattan. I worked at Chase Manhattan City Bank. Here's a conspiracy theory, so you'll love this one. Chase Manhattan City, <laughs> Anderson Consulting, Ernst & Young, J.P. Morgan, and then Goldman Sachs. I also did American Express and the World Trade Center as well for a while as, <laughs> as a temp, as a, as, a, as a freelancer. But my my, my matrix job was in, finally in, in Goldman Sachs. But um, so, uh, yeah, and they, 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 you, you deal with people who are very good at money. They went to colleges, universities like Princeton and Yale and Harvard and Berkeley, but they were not good at language. They were not, yeah. they, they, they had difficulty communicating money talk into language. And I was tell you, I, I moved up the ladder because I was very good at t teaching fellas how to talk and read and write because they didn't, they had a very formal use of language, but didn't really, you know, have um, a proper way like to a, communicate. A, a rote intelligence. I find it with people that are very good, you know, straight A students in uh, a system, they're very good at rote memory of remembering things, but they're not very good at exploring language or, or teasing it out or kind of testing it, boundaries and stuff like that. They're not, I, I, that's the most thing I find because I know people that are really smart, like I suppose the system, re the system re rewards a, a certain type of intelligence and that seems to be one of it, so. Yeah, and obedience. Like I had one guy say to me that uh, these guys are all left-brained. A business won't work without right-brained people helping them. And he was into the whole Betty Edwards going on the right side of the brain thing. So they, there was a, there was a, these people had an understanding of themselves. Yeah. But also, well, culture was a very different place back then. They were not. I don't know how it is now, but it was a. Uh, there was a lot of working class people that worked made 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 their way in there, working on the trading floors. It probably started as bookies. You know, running number scams yeah. down in Brooklyn. Yeah. Like that. But yet they ended up being very good at the financial business. And, you know, you see that in films like Wall Street. A lot of them would be the, the, the brokers and the fellas on the trading floor were like from working class backgrounds around New York and Philadelphia and places like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's not that. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, it's, the, the, these places are far more dynamic than just a bunch of money hungry bastards wanting to rob people you know that kind of thing it's more than that they're, they're almost like a, a life form by themselves but interesting enough in Goldman Sachs on Wall Street on the top floor they had a fantastic library that was free to use by any of the staff and when I say it was a library I mean it was the best that's where I first found that about Edward Bernays I'd heard the name but I didn't know about it until a manager was one day was got a quote on his desk by Edward Bernays in a frame he used to put different frame quotes either he was this was a character it was a but he used to put 
different frame quotes every day. And you say, you love me for some reason. And you say, come on in, come on, talk to me. I need, I need <laughs> someone to bring I need someone who's airy to have a conversation. And he'd sit there and there are all these different quotes. And one of them was by Edward E. Bernays. I don't know what it was. And then he said to me, oh, yeah, this guy was the guy who invented basically World War One <laughs> and uh, all this stuff. And he goes, he was like a young guy who was brought to the White House at 24 from Austria, Sigmund Freud's nephew. And I said, well, as I went right upstairs and got propaganda. And uh, so, like, you know, I'm a great believer that there's opportunity everywhere in every aspect yeah. of life to yeah. and grow your consciousness. And so I'd never wasted a moment in, when it came to things like that. And when you came back, when you came back to Ballymun on that project, what what was your sense then? Like that that was a that was almost like a homecoming of, you know, a su success story, if you like, the local the local well, kids. Oh no no they didn't know didn't, no it's like Ballymun. I didn't come back to Ballymun as such. My parents had moved up. My family had all moved to Halla by then. So I was unknown, really. No, I'm probably oh, the most yeah. famous person at Batman Flats, honestly, really, when I think about it, in terms of like I've written a best selling book and everything. So, you know, oh, you yeah, don't know about me because I'm not, you have, even there, even there, Jerry, you have to be part of the clique. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yeah. Damien Dempsey didn't get that Irish Rail ad for nothing. You have to yeah, be yes. Yeah. They can sing all the songs they want about the work and man and all this. But there's a certain element of middle class them that gets them out of that scene and gets them ex they, they have to become compliant in order to get that book set. They have I to make it. Yeah, they absolutely. knew by looking at one, I'd never be compliant ever. And they have to make it, they have to make a comprom they, they have to make there's a compromise being made there. You can see it even with um Tommy Tiernan at the moment on RT. Um that 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 chat show they gave him i would have said if tommy tiernan just as an example hadn't that rt show he'd have a lot more to say on the covid era than he's been prepared to say um yeah but then i suspect do it, but i wouldn't go on i wouldn't go on then i wouldn't do it maybe yeah, i'm being a, bit, you know, being a bit up my own ass but that's honestly i wouldn't i would like yeah. you either you know you see you see comedians like uh steve Hughes paying the price for actually telling the truth you know yeah, yeah. and you know, I would do the same. I'd, I'd rather have a clean soul than do that. I mean, when Puzzling People was doing really well, I got a call from Ryan Tuberty or Pat Kenny, one of those shows, I think it was Pat Kenny, on the radio, and they says, would you come in and talk for 15 minutes about your book? And I said, no. <laughs> and she goes, why? And she goes, I, I just don't I just don't want to go in there and, and deal with that. I'm not. I'm not interested in talking about it. I don't want to. We're not with you people. And she kind of paused <laughs> in turn. And she says, you know, Thomas, you're very foolish. There's a, there'll be a million and a half listeners at least. And you will have an opportunity to go on the Late Late Show. And I says, well, no, I'm definitely not doing it. And yeah. she goes, she goes, she goes she, this is like, you know, you have a chance here to get. No, I said, I'd probably be put on with some psychiatrist or psychologist from UCD and I'd be trashed for 15 minutes and not be on it. And secondly, yeah. I did George Nuri and Coast to Coast last year. American was 16 and a half million listeners. So I'm not I'm not interested in playing to a smaller audience and a hungry home. <laughs> and I I, I waited I'd waited since that day that they they Ballymun gave that false report on the kids in Ballymun to get them back on that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's the, the, it's the, right. Yeah, I always remember that RT are, are nothing. Oh, hundred percent. Because that's the thing. That's why one of the one of the interests I have is getting um is getting people off platforms that can kind of make them compliant or compromised, and to stay independent, stay out doing your own like thing. Otherwise, because you even see it, you probably find it as well, or maybe you you find it more. Is you you occasionally get somebody approach you to maybe write write something or you know talk about something and it's not it even though it's only in a small and it's often they don't understand that they're doing it and you kind of have to say i'm sorry that's not how i write or maybe it, it has to resonate with me right? like it has to originate in me as opposed to originating for something you somebody else wants to do um but it, i i think the covid it's only the covid era that's really 
to be honest, in my mind, got me completely 360 vision on what's going on and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but look how it's liberated you. Look oh, how it's liberate. Look how it's liberated. Mm. You know, the, if, you know, you, you're right. Your, your writing is excellent, but you would have never got into papers like to be a proper journal, proper journalist. Yeah, uh, yeah. like the, uh, in May, for the simple reason that you're not, you're not playing the game. I mean, this is the irony of it. You, you look at, you know, again, little fish, little pond, big fish. I'm probably more famous around the world than any RT presenter. Annie Orty star, right? Yeah, yeah. John Walker was the biggest journalist in Ireland. He fell foul of that corrupt scene. He's mm -hmm. gone off on his own. And now he's famous all over the world. He's no longer. Oh, like I can see you can, you can you can see the Renaissance coming for John, like even yeah. because he made the he he made the right calls when they read when nobody like in terms of a public figure who was formerly on, you know, the an an accepted face in RT studios and Irish newspapers. He made some of the hard calls and he got them right early. And he's, I can see it now. The appetite for John Waters around the world is in, is starting to, le, you know, levitate again. And yeah, no, he, even, though John likes, even though John likes a lot of hippie music and stuff, to me, John is like Ireland's most last punk rocker. Yeah. yeah. Because the, what he did was like probably the greatest act of punk rock in this country. Yeah. He actually told the media to go shove it up their uh, backsides and went off and did his own thing. Yeah. And did it. Yeah, and did it. And, I, and I'm and i hoping it's successful, uh, and it is successful. But I think that's the, that's the, that's the trap people, I, one of the concerns I have, I like, I, I generalize just from my own head, I kind of call everybody that's within this, that got that, that got the COVID question correct. For whatever reason they got it correct i kind of now they all got it correct for different reasons possibly but the way i kind of look at it i just say like they're kind of some sort of an awake personalities um but i do see what i do i do see like when people on that side are trying to do form national kind of movements and stuff like this and i kind of see it as well you're just really trying to build the same system back again um and you're going to end up in exactly the same place and i kind of yeah. that's why i kind of steer away from it a bit well i've still i've always stayed away from it because the word revolution just means to revolve back to where you began and that's yeah. all that is you know uh, I would be much more in favour of uh, the idea of a parallel society where we can yeah. actually exi exist and take advantage of what we can use in the regular mainstream society and at the same time to build a whole new way of living to the side of that, that we mm -hmm. can actually have a more a, a greater quality of life, a more satisfying existence with, with people of a kind. Now, this is why I use the term tribes. I yeah, use that very literally. I use that very literally. When I say it's a tribe, or we have different tribes and that's literally where i see the future uh, because we you know i look to groups you know like the amish now uh hasidic jews travelers uh romany gypsies and other groups like that and i say they kind of have it right they're not completely owned by the the system they're in the system sure they make the system work for them as much as they need it but they're on the seminole indians in the us and other groups like that they're on the other side of it. They have a, they're on, they're in a parallel lane to it. So if well, something it, happens in this, they're not destroyed by it. They keep on going. And I think that's, that's why that's why the tribal thing means a lot to me. You know, that for that reason. And that's and that's a better way of putting it too, because the 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 traveler comparison is probably the is probably the the one to make is in an Irish context in terms of because exactly that they have they they they're very um they're very conscious of protecting the tribe um sometimes you might say too much i know it from having kids um you know where the intersection points are between and i live in a town with a lot of travelers and um, but you do see the intersection points we will say between the settled and the pre-covid the the settled and the traveler communities would have been the national school system and the cat the catholicism but within that they were very protective of um 
keeping the kind of originality or the um you know the the tribe t together through time that to pass on to the next generation so you would uh, well, i have a greater appreciation of that post covid than i did pre covid well it's about authenticity at the, at mm. the end of the day i mean you, we're, we're confronted in every just everything in our life and every situation in our life we're confronted by a question and if, I, if you swallow the feeling into yourself and say how do i feel about this your subconscious mind instantly gives you the answer to a good feeling your your subconscious good feelings never set you wrong that's what really you know what happened with those of us who ran have ended up on the right side of history over the whole covid thing what's happened there is that early on we just stepped back and went i, I don't feel right about this it's as simple as that it's not a, 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 but that's jerry i'm not joking you that's actually the start of a spiritual experience because yeah, that's it is very much rooted in a spiritual concept whatever you wanted to see spiritual that was the concept of your deal your what the greeks call your daemon the, mm -hmm. your, your internal self, your other part of you and that was you know immediately like i can remember when the rona thing first kicked off the propaganda was a sensational but i also knew adelaine on thick but then i was going half the ba when he started talking about the wuhan labs and 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 labs i said half the bastards actually done something stupid like made a bioweapon and it's gotten out you know that's 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 a logical regional concern you know and then after then I, started, then I started saying i better like hold off on this one before i really give any and then when i saw the stats two things that did it for me the line of trucks parked on the street in milan in italy serving no purpose it, and then the field hospital with the battleship beside it set up by the dublin docks and i said to myself it's a scam it's a, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's 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 a mind fuck. it's it they're playing with us there's something else going on here and instantaneously i had that feeling like you're home you're in the right place and then i went start making the own one of the videos and banging it all out and, and i've been shown to be 99 percent correct in everything i've said not because not because i'm a prophet not because i'm a seer but because i you learn when you when you break away from mainstream thinking and you know this yourself and I'm sure in recent months and years i'm sure you've noticed this mm -hmm. you start to see things with a clarity that never existed before and that clarity is almost comical when you see that they play certain games like for instance they're now talking about the the bombing of the Nord Stream two, and I don't want to get too much into politics because I could have made it. The Nord Stream two pipeline, uh, an opportunity to yeah, move yeah, away yeah. from fossil fuels. Just yeah. people called the Rona an opportunity to build back better. That you, mm -hmm. it's almost comical how the psychopaths in charge have no playbook other than the one that they always use. Absolutely, and to be honest, that is. <clears throat> that's how I've always approached the writing of things. It's it, in terms of dealing with the media is to look at what they're not talking about. So when you talked about the Wuhan labs there, I was on that. I was on that. I was on. I was on the Corona gravy train in early January of that 2020. Following us in you know following some po podcasts that were talking about it when nobody was talking about it, and what you notice there is. A, a thing like that, there was no appetite to chase after that very real concern and possibility. There was like zero media looking to, to, to talk about it. So that always, to me, tells me they don't, okay, they don't want to talk about it. There's a problem there. So obviously, the same with the Nord Stream. Yeah. And that Blinken, um, they've jumped from a situation where they've more than likely have, bonds, have been involved in the bombing of those two uh, pipelines. And now they've switched on a dime to, oh, this is a great opportunity. Well, let's not talk about that, but look at the great opportunity there is here now. And I'm thinking mm, that just is kind of confirming to me what um, is a suspicion. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's absolutely true. What they tell you on the mainstream news headlines, the opposite is true. Mm. The simple as that. You go to, you know, because everything they see now is an editorial. Like I saw that that's a that's a very that's not a very old thing. If you read news newspapers from the seventies, sixties, fifties, they generally report the news straight up as it was. 
Around the 1980s, the New York Times started this whole thing of turning every single story into an editorial. So therefore, mm-hmm. an insert at the end of the story, say they have a copy and press release from some university, PR company, news agency, government, whatever. And they, they would re- rewrite them verbatim and then at the end punch in the editorial. So for instance, like you say, uh, blah, 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 blah. There was a, a shortage of housing in Brooklyn and people can't find places to live because it's so expensive. And uh, then at the bottom, uh, according to the Republican governor, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there was no money to be spent on this. You know, we always like a little punch, a little editorial swing in favor of kind of liberal globalism at the end. Now, yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. pro-Republican or anything. But, uh, no, 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 like, I, I know what you're saying. That. Yeah. And that, that's now standard in so-called journalism. It's all editorialization. You know, yeah, you yeah. look at like the, you look at someone like Claire Bourne. To, Claire Bourne is a storyteller. During the Rona er- period, she was like, the, the, you know, the balance sheet. The, 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 she was like the, what's the, the, the old Irish uh, story, the, the, the story, Shano storyteller. And yeah, she'd yeah. sit there relaying all oh, the horrors of COVID, the horrors of the COVID. And that was not news, that was not reporting, that was not current affairs, that was out and out propaganda sold in the style of a storyteller sitting by the fireplace, scaring the shite out of the nation. And yeah. uh, it was comical and laughable, but it's also incredibly sinister uh, because there's a wickedness there. It was derived from the need to terrorize the public. Mm-hmm. And to, it kind of brings us nicely into, um, you know, your 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 Rona chronicles. Um, did you notice a big up? Did you notice a change or an addition to your audience um, when when all this came across? Because I, I've heard a number of people in Tume privately say to me, and I said, "Oh, you know Thomas Sheridan?" She said, "Yeah, yeah I, he got me through the pandemic." That you, that would be the most frequent thing I've heard said about. Oh, yeah, his videos got me through the pandemic. Was that noticeable, noticeable yeah. to you? Yeah, I, d- I doubled the audience in a couple of weeks. Wow. So yeah. it's trouble, you know, and that wasn't even by design, that just happened. And mm-hmm. uh, it showed me that there was a lot of people out there who were asking the same questions. So, you know, I made those videos for myself as much as anyone else. It was like, <laughs> it was me, it, it was like a, th- a therapy session. What the hell is going on here, really? <laughs> and I, I have to say, the comment sections of my videos are sensational. Yeah. Because, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, don't just listen to me, read the comment sections of what people write down below. And you yeah. will see the world really is and what people are going through and still are going through. And, yeah, yeah. and uh, it, it's a, uh, it, it, it was all that we were all in this, we, we all felt the same way. Mm-hmm. The bewilderment. I mean, a friend of mine here in Sligo called it a great bewildering. I think that was a part of it. Uh, you know, we're bewildered by the whole thing. But yeah, uh, th- yes, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, it, it grew the audience big time. And people, but what, the beautiful thing about it is, is, uh, and it's probably a bit weird too as well that people have no interest in things that I'm interested in like the occult and stuff like that I know it's like <laughs> you know I mean I, I'm not joking but it's like you know grandmothers from mental Keynes who are now like interested in chaos magic and things like that <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of really spin off from it you know because yeah, it opened yeah. the door to what you, should, you know people who in the past would have said this guy's what's this guy shouting about but now they kind of get it because I'm actually able to show them that a lot of the things that I've talked about when I, in that part of my work is actually in the media during the, the COVID thing. You know, you want to describe what the, what the media did during the COVID thing was black magic. The, mm-hmm. the, the, the meaning of black magic is to change the consciousness of someone else for your will and not theirs. So again, so that was, that's, that's black magic 101. And everything from the battleship parked down by the docks with the field hospital to the the coppers looking in the bags in the news, to all the terror, you know, uh, Claire born in our shed, so socially isolating. That's all. That's all the definition of black magic. It's to terrorize you. Uh, uh, oh, uh, what's his name? O'Neill, the Professor O'Neill. Uh, oh, Luke O'Neill. Professor O'Neill. In, in, in his bubble. In his bubble. And that that kind of stuff. That's all the death. The death. You won't know. If anyone ever asks you over again. What was black magic? You say RTE, CNN, BBC, Sky, the lot of them, all during the COVID thing. That was black magic. Yeah, yeah. 
No, it was amazing. Now that that kind of leads on to a, one of the one of the videos that I, I really enjoyed there in the last month that you produced uh, was the concept the the concept of the the unvaccinated being an archetype, and, and maybe you could um, go through that a little bit with um, my kind of um, audience in the West Awake. Well, you know, the the concept of an archetype is something that represents um, a, a facet of human behavior or consciousness or a type of person that stands out as a particular thing. Like there's also, you know, there's a white knight, there's a, there's a person, everyone we know, we can kind of apply them to a white knight and they're into an archetype. So he's a white knight. He's out in the community helping the, the poor, helping the homeless and stuff like that. She's a goddess. He's a, she's a healer. He's a wizard. You know, this kind of thing. He's a villain. He's a dragon slayer. That's a dragon. You know, and they all represent these things. Uh, so, on or uh, to, to some degree, we're all an archetype, you know, of some mm -hmm. kind, and we end up in archetypal situations where you have similar things repeating themselves. So, what are the unvaccinated now? Well, they're unvaccinated are the same archetype that gave us the the witches of the Middle Ages who were burnt, and uh, the the Catholics and Protestants, depending on what part of Europe you landed in during the Reformation being persecuted uh the you know the the jews in world war ii the uh the tatars in the bolshevik revolution there's all you know the the un, the, the the decadent western western thinking types during the chinese cultural revolution there's the outsider you know colin Wilson wrote a phenomenal book called the outsider and he, he described the lives of people like Nietzsche and hp lovecraft as the person who's outside society you know that they're, they're just they come in from left field with different ways of thinking and this they're almost like created by the dynamic of consciousness in order to bring this new way of thinking in this new kind of angle in and and ultimately serve humanity as a whole well you can get groups that are like that and we're you know you can get groups that are like that you know and they often form you know in organically like you would have like the original peace movement you know this kind of thing or people like the beginning of the trade union movement when it was less official and more like workers who were saying you know well, enough you're not going to do this you will find yourself being a pariah you will find yourself being hated by that society being discriminated by that society but ultimately it's a hero's journey towards victory because yeah. this people to take from this it's like Lant gandhi said we've already won it's just the means of your departure that needs to be worked out. It's the same thing. Once they come back at a certain way, once you've been, you, once you become this archetype of the, what they call us, what we're called, they call us conspiracy theorists and far right and all this stuff, because they can't put a, they can't find a new term to give us because we're a new thing. You know, I call it the triumph, but we're a new thing, right? So we, we, we shock them. What's who, what's this all about? What's so the, the instant thing is to, to firstly to mock us, laugh at us, tinfoil hat, blah blah blah. After a while, that doesn't work out because the things that we say would happen, Vax ID passes, uh, the restrictions wouldn't be lifted, their countries would use it to actually oppress their people. Uh, they wouldn't they would take certain medications off the shelf in order to give people their medications. Uh, that they that they it, it all came true. So suddenly the laughing doesn't work anymore. Then a kind of hatred kind of appeared. Then you have to try and make you hate them. They're a cause of all the problems. We could have beaten Rona sooner if the unvaccinated had to, you know, we had who was that animal from the Irish star? Uh, Paul or something, a journal so called journal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who a, a, dr a drunk driving low life who demanded that the that the vaccinated be beaten be forced vaccinated or thrown out of our society. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You, you know that cretin, right? Uh, that that's the next stage. It goes to that, and uh, and and from that then and then there's a there was a point where they want you to go away. That you know the archetype is okay. Enough. I don't want to hear anymore. And we're at that stage now. And that stage is like all the people now say things like. Oh, the COVID is so 2021. Get over it. Oh, vaccinations, uh, vax conspiracy. Oh, that's, so that's because they know we stuck by our guns and have been right to this point. Okay. So now the next stage is they fall apart. 
and this is happening at incredible speed. The world is this, is, this is unprecedented how quickly this is happening. If someone had told me in 2020, April, May-ish, that by late 2020, like October 2022, we would be at the stage right now, I wouldn't have believed that. So it's going to take four or five years. We're okay. flying along. A lot of it has to do with happenstances in the greater world, like Putin invasion, Russia, and stuff like that. But it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. The, the, as a good pagan, I can tell you that gods work, move in mysterious ways. And this is what's happening. We're now at the stage where they want us just to go away. Uh, we won't go away. And we've, we've stuck to our guns. And what's made us, and it's a beautiful thing, is that it, it, they tr in the early days when they were having the protests in around Dublin and other cities about the lockdowns, my attitude was, don't go. I respect you for going. Uh, I understand why you're going. But they will co-opt it and take it over, and they will they will do things like what RTE did. They will put signs, give people signs to hold up, or have their employees there that they had obvious grammatical errors and misspellings on them to make it look like anyone who's questioning lockdown is a nut job. I said, don't go, and they'll also it's Jim Fein will fill it full of the usual the usual types waving Palestinian flags. Don't go, and they did it, and it happened just like that. And you'll come home feeling worse than when you went. The only good thing about it is you make connections and you meet people. So that's why I try to encourage people, instead of going to protest, find a coffee shop or somewhere agreeable, or even someone's house, and meet up in little gatherings and do it that mm -hmm. way. That way they can't own you. And if someone tries to come in and own you, they will be spotted very quickly. Now, uh, and it's very difficult to infiltrate a small group. It's very, very difficult. So that's that was a better strategy now i think that's been very successful in the fact mm -hmm. that we didn't have these endless marches we didn't get owned by them mm -hmm. i think just one thing we can have you know whatever we are this tribe whatever we are we can hold our heads with a certain dignity that we did it just purely by intellect and force of consciousness things like even things like using memes on social media having a you know we, there was very little paranoia and terror that i could see people went through difficult painful times my attitude was always on the wrong ironicals relax it'll be okay just wait i've always been a great believer in just wait play we were playing out an archetypal role that's been played out in human consciousness and history many times over i promise you it'll be okay in the end you'll be able to go and haunt me again you know we're not going we're not going to get paradise never that's that's that, that's a misleading idea but we will get through this and we will mm -hmm. better people or we'll have a better world and now it's got to the point now where someone comes on to like a great, a great, I'm a great believer in the psychic weather. You can read the, the, the world by the, the, what I call the Renfield, the people who are just driven by pure mainstream impulse. And the, 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 the common section on papers like the journal.ie a year and a half ago is an utter cesspool. An utter cesspool. Anyone who demonstrated any kind of Questioning of the narrative were attacked. How are you, Gemma? How are you, Joe? You know, uh, how, are you, how are you, John? This kind of thing, you know, like all of all, no, they're back in foil and all these, all these idiots, you know. And then that's all stopped now. And when someone <laughs> comes and goes, you know, I think this this guy is a, is a dodgy bastard and we've been actually led down the garden path here on this thing. It gets thumbs up. And there's no, so we've won. Remember that we have won. So let that. me let me just ask you a question there, Thomas, because and, it, and to link it in, because if you think where the next stage might be, I bring you back to your Goldman Sachs example and how they recognized in something in you that they didn't have and they wanted, but understood the value of, if you know what I mean, yeah. while they didn't have it themselves. Is there a danger that they, they will say the psychopathic element are, are looking at the kind of, the, the small cohort on facts and saying how do we 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 can't we haven't defeated them we're probably not going to defeat them but how do we let find a way to control them yes and this is an important question firstly we're at a pivotal and a, and a fortunate place in history that the whatever you want to call it, the new world order whatever this like globalist thing is called has for their own benefit played nothing but idiots and governments 
But basically, <laughs> every Western government is over is is is, is populated with dullards, morons, halfwits, lulas, and every kind of like knuckle, knuckle dragging simpleton you could act. There's absolutely no one of any dynamic personality in any Western government. So therefore, they are the kind of people that wouldn't recognize our potential. They wouldn't even understand it. I mean, uh, my great, uh, my great, my great sort of like maximum, maxim or test is the, to understand the character of a person, would I want to go for a pint with them? That's always been my thing. Now, <laughs> you know, I, and even if they're a quiet, a shy person, that isn't a very engaging, you'll still want to go for a pint with them because you know you'd have a pleasant time in the company of mm -hmm. someone who's an agreeable human being. Well, I don't see anyone in government, it, and when I say government, it's an important distinction that folks have to make. Don't just think of politicians, think of the civil service, think of the well, they're the biggest danger. Especially the NGOs, and all think these kinds of things. Don't be hung up on some, you know, man, Leo this and John that and all that, you know, th don't be hung up on that. Be hung up, remember, they're figureheads for, they're basically a fly on the top of a turret. It's a tour you have to worry about more than the flight, and this is what you need to concentrate on. And so, uh, you know, you know, we'll vote the bastards out. You know, well, all you're going to get is just another fly on top of the same tour. You know, it's still it's going to happen. So, you know, the democracy has no place for us, and democracy is dead as a system. I totally understand now why the likes of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and the founding fathers of America, like and so and Adams and so on, wrote long essays on the. The, how horrible democracy was and how it was basically a terrible system and uh, the work that they went in the u.s constitution to actually give them a republic with some semblance of democracy but all these safeguards to make sure it never become mob rule like the, the electoral college and so on i totally get that now democracy mm -hmm. we're told from the time our kids democracy is sacrosanct oh you don't have a vote you don't have a say this kind of thing right but now we know it's all bollocks. It's a lot of shite. It's there's no. So those of you who want to think, so so, uh, too many of us in the tribes now are too wise to this. So yeah, yeah. The, obvious thing, the obvious thing for the other side to do would be let's form a party, let's form a political <laughs> party, and let's get some someone in to run it. But that's already they, they, that won't work because we're not interested in standing for election. We're not mm -hmm. interested in voting. We're not even interested in the democratic system. We, we're beyond that. We've moved off somewhere else. So therefore, mm -hmm. they can't form a political party we're going to vote for because we don't care. And that's that's one way they can't do it. Who are they going to get as a celebrity to kind of lead us off? They're, they're desperately trying to use Russell Brand over in the UK and it's working to a certain degree. But they're not they're not they're not they're not going to get the, the, the people who are truly wise to this stuff onto that because we now see the purpose of celebrity. We know what celebrity is, it's bollocks. And and let me show you let me tell you something else. If one beautiful thing came out of the whole Rona thing, we discovered that all our celebrities and most of our musical heroes were some of the biggest pussies that ever walked the face of the earth and the biggest <laughs> establishment sellouts. You know, when you yeah, have yeah. Ray the Machine and the Kaiser Chiefs demanding vaccinated people at a concert, you know exactly what we were dealing with all those years. So, that, you know, and then there's been honourable people who've come out of that, like Ian Brown and Van Morrison and a few mm -hmm. others, you know, come out of all this, this you know, smelling of roses, and they'll they remember for the right ways in history, just like we will. I mean, but uh, so they, I can't think of a way they can actually get us all over, you know, unless yeah, they, you know, yeah they, 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 there's too many of us. And 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 here's the beautiful thing now, Jerry, and people have to remember this. My good friend Enor Crane always said to me, What gives the alternative seeing the power is that we're not organized, yeah, we yeah. have no central leadership. We have no constitution, we've no minutes. We come, we meet up at events, we do our own thing, and then we we all run off somewhere else. <laughs> and we can't control that. So I'm talking to you. Next week I'll be talking to someone else. But we're just we're, it's they're very loose associations. And they're, that's not, and that's the way they should yeah, and I think that that's the way they should stay. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so if anyone ever came up to me, like I've had people come up to me and say, Thomas. Why don't you run for election? Now, if I was to do it, it'd be done for the presidency and it'd be done for a big laugh. It'd be done for just a troll. <laughs> and I would I would definitely enjoy it for a troll. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
No, I'd rather chew off my own bark during an electric fence than run in a, for electric uh, for election. It's awful. But should you, yeah, you can see you could throw a blanket over Varadkar, Macron, the dude in Canada, and that lady down in um, Ardern down in New Zealand. They're all you could throw a blanket over them, and they're and the words coming out of their mouth are more or less the fucking same thing. You know? Yeah, they, that, they are a classic example of an archetype because they're all the same kind of entity in different yeah. resolved in different forms. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I, I still there's still too many people in the singing here in Ireland who still think the answer is elections and voting and stuff like that. No, sorry, dudes, that's not going. You, you, you're not going to get out that way. The best way to do it all is to ignore that system, live in a parallel society, and you will find that you will that thing you'll realize how unimportant all that stuff is when you have your own thing together. Like, for instance, use cash. Use cash yeah. as much as possible. You know, that little things like that. And uh, you be, small things like that are very empowering and so yeah. on. You know, and there's, there's lots of things you can do. But there's, stop watching RT in the news. I always only see it from like clips on YouTube that people send me. But don't, ha don't watch that stuff. Don't get involved in it. Don't have emotional aspects. And, and, I mean, a, a lot of people still in the apparent of scene still have an emotional engagement with the news, even if they watch it, Tucker Carlson or something, you know, Neil, yeah, Neil yeah. Alton or something. They still are, I said, don't be emotional. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't get caught up in it. Just observe it like it's strategic intelligence during a war. Yeah, Recognize it and then use it. But don't let it overwhelm you because when as soon as you're as soon as you're upset by the latest thing that this, that, and the other done, you're automatically a prisoner. Now, I totally understand we were upset by things like the lockdown. I was brutally upset by having my freedom taken away by the lockdowns. It, you know, I, I was livid. But, a set, but as, soon as, that was, as soon as I found a way to talk out of that, I was okay. We'd have to use a strategic method of getting out of it. One of them was, ironically, I got all my people together and we started going on internet message boards and start asking for eternal lockdown. <laughs> uh, a reverse psychology thing uh, and it, it was amazing how it works like you'd have all these these muppets on the journal that is i see another rt side going well we need to keep the lockdown going because you know the case numbers are up and then we'd I'd have we'd, i have our people going in there and saying this pair it's uh, that's not even enough and we made we even made, <laughs> the, we even made the hashtag eternal lockdown we have, to have an eternal lockdown it's the only way we'll get to zero COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly the same ones who are nee, 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 would go, oh, well, we can't have a lockdown forever. And it says, oh, you're, so you're not serious now about fighting COVID. <laughs> You'd be amazed at that, how, that, how well that worked. How well that worked. <laughs> because we actually made them say, if you want to play these games, Bastard, let's play it to the extreme and see what the reality of that extreme is as opposed to your sanctimonious virtue signaling in public. It's mm -hmm. not pretty. It's like, well, we're already there before you. And that mm -hmm. was like, things like that you can do. You can be very clever. Yeah, yeah. But the, to be honest, like, when you look at that, when you look, when I look at the, um, not the just the lockdown, but the domestic COVID pass in a weird way was such a huge clarifying moment for our tribe to see. It was like, okay, we, there's 100% no doubt about what these people will do. Um, and promote like so from yeah. that point is i have no question mark now in my head wide earthly world that anyone in our government is a valid protector of our freedoms because there's okay. certainly not so i think for, uh, and i don't think you're gonna i think that, that that's the longer things we get away from that and look back at it the more clarifying and that that is for our for you know for people like us so that and the other side then is if you think of it as an archetype a year ago we were all out there and we didn't know who where everybody was or who or is there you know people close to us now most people we kind of know our size and we know how to communicate if we yeah. need to and that's a you know that's a that's a huge plus now if, you know and now it going hitting into the next 12 months i suppose yeah we all we understand our own limitations too as well as our own yeah. possibilities very important 
And we also recognize people that we can engage with and others that are just wasting our time. Yeah. And it's important, you know, uh, this evangelical thing of trying to convert people to our side. That's another reason why we were successful. Uh, people finally broke away from the spell of having to convert others to my side. They basically said, look, that's what I believe and that's the end of it. I don't care what you believe. That's a very powerful position to take that's that's a that's that's a supremely beautiful position to be at where it says well i think the whole thing is a scam really well prove it i don't have to i just know it and if you have the figures yeah should, should present evidence no why because i've got to go watch the football match that's <laughs> that was that was a winning strategy and i saw that a lot, a lot of people when if they wanted you back into a corner posting links and posting yeah. out and my, you know, the attitude is, look, uh, my, my, one, one thing on it, everything that's negative about the lockdowns, the vaccinations, and every the social, the economic damage was all outlined in peer-reviewed documents, our favorite term, before all this happened or when it happened in the early days. It was not hidden. It was found with a, a, a cursory sent search on the internet, and you, you, it was there to be found. And I, we found it in the early days and said, oh, well, that's that. And uh, that's, yeah, that was the end for us with no further proof needed because they yeah. want you to constantly dig yourself into a hole. Where's the proof? Where's the facts? And they will always, they will always invoke, well, you're not uh, qualified. You did yeah, yeah. You're not qualified. Yeah. They would have gotten nowhere. Could you imagine in the air, the guy who invented the wheel in the Mesolithic times, saying, I've invented this thing called a wheel. If you have two of them, we can move a cart really fast. You're not an engineer, you're not qualified. That's literally the world we live in today, where <laughs> anyone who has any kind of eureka moments are usually are just instantly put down because they don't have the qualifications. And uh, yeah, yeah and that's beautiful. The way their, our side just basically said, I don't care what you think, not, I don't give a shit. And that's yeah. really important. And uh, that, that ties in with the stuff Desmet kind of points to this idea that only a tech, only the technocrat, technocratic elites with the expertise and qualifications are allowed to decide on elements of our freedom. Like, you know, you saw it with the science and the COVID, you're going to see it now with, you know, you see it even now with the climate stuff and the war stuff and all of it. Like, but it's, it's like, it's the same playbook all over again, you know? Absolutely. And, it, you know, it, I think more people are seeing through it, though. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I believe so, too. On the mainstream sites, you say, oh, the experts who told us this shite for the last two and a half years and none of it is <laughs> true, you know. Or the, or the, or didn't they say the vaccine would work? You know, so there's a lot of... The, I, yeah, I think yeah. they, they, they've shot themselves in the foot because of their own hubris. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. No, yeah, I, no, I agree with you. So for, like, the... I'm just going to say, yeah. except for a few, like, idiots, Luke O'Neill is considered universally a clown in this country, even by me. Well, to be honest, I anytime I see him, I look at him and I think he does. He's he looks, he looks like the most unhealthy man in the country. Anytime I see him, um, yeah, well, and he's he's I, increasingly he's get he's um, he's getting. I think I, I I get the impression he's getting people coming up to him now everywhere he goes with the the, the dissenting voice or the 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 cry. You know, you were wrong. This that and that, and I think. He, it's a, to me, he looks like a man that this is having a, a psychological effect, and that in turn is having a, an issue in his health. Oh yeah, he's invoked. To use like a pagan like con theory concept allegory, he's invoked the wrath of the gods because he is his charisma was built on false pretense. It was not built upon his dynamic personality or his ability to woo people on his natural being. Everything about him, his guitar and everything shows someone who has like never got attention in school or something and is desperate for attention as an adult so he got his charisma which has means the grace of the gods through false pretense through something that wasn't real now the no death in the universe ever goes unpaid so he's now having to pay back that with interest and he's under enormous psychic attacks from people who now see him for what he is he'll never recover from this in fact when he was at his, his height when he was wearing dark sunglasses and singing with his guitar, the rock and roll professor. I might, I was looking at him going, motherfucker, you're going to have the biggest fall of them all. And because I, his insincerity and his false charisma was there in spades. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. 
Now, I suppose, uh, what what's um, what's consuming your thoughts at the moment, Thomas, in terms of what you're doing or what's coming up in the future for you? I've, I'm chastising p- Irish people who claim to be awake for still using politicians by their first, yes. calling politicians <laughs> by their first fucking names. Please, <laughs> please stop calling them by their first names. If mm. you want to terrorise an Irish politician, there is what there's one thing that hurts them more than you coming into Leinster House with a grenade through the windows and a machine gun is calling them not by their first names. That is used to control you. They are not your friends. They are not your mates. And when you go, you know, and I see people on this side going, Oh no, Neo, get us out of lockdown, will you? That's a dog begging his master. Remember that. Never call these creatures by their first names. Address them by their second name. That's why they do it in the army. Because this, this it imposes... When you're calling them by the first name, you are a kind of a lower level mate asking a, a, a more powerful buddy, just subconsciously, to do you a favour. But when you walk up and say, Baradgar, Martin... Coppinger, the dynamic I can guarantee you completely changes because suddenly they're no longer, you're no longer subordinate. You're on unequal terms with them. You've stripped them down of their false charisma and elevated persona into what they don't want to be seen as one of you mm-hmm. because their whole self image is based on being better than you. Yeah. And they don't like that. Okay, and now when you call them by their first name, that's been used as a, a psychological weapon in this country for about 30, 40 years to by politicians to get away with all kinds of shit because, well, they're our mates. We call them by their first names. You address them by their formal title, minister this, deputy that, whatever. And or mm-hmm. preferably by the second name and very nonchalantly stated. I mean, I even saw, I, I see people that are genuinely angry at the government calling politicians by their worst names. And it does my head in because I'm saying, you're a slave begging for a, bisc- a dog biscuit. Never do that. Stop that now. If you want to change this, if you want to rattle the biscuit out of this government, start calling them by their second names and stop the first names thing. And you, you will also find that not only does that put them in a very difficult position because they know they don't own you as a little dog anymore, well, you will find that your own consciousness starts to change because suddenly mm-hmm. you start your relationship with them in a very, very different manner. Suddenly you're not a subordinate. You're mm-hmm. on the same level as them. And you will find your confidence increases, your sense of self-awareness increases, and your ability to express yourself in terms of engaging with power systems will ultimately be, be more beneficial in your favor. So stop calling our politicians, please, by our first names. Yeah, good, good, well, well said. It, it leads on to something I want to ask you about before we before we finish up, and it's the, you know, the the, the, progre- the pro- progressive left social agenda that is pervasive through our society. You've you've a way of you have a great way of uh, describing that as an attack on the working class, and. What, the other thing is, when I want to tie that in to the likes of, we'll say, Murphy the TD, just to get rid of his first name. <laughs> As how do these people get the working class? Like Murphy's obviously not working class, yeah, and yes, he gets a following of. I'm, you know, it, this was brought home to me on the str- when I went up to um, Dublin at the weekend to. Just in chat with all the protesters that were there outside Mount Joy for um, Ina Burke, and I, I, I kind of consumed by the idea and notions. How do they, how do they trick that per- type of person? Well, because they're they call him by their first names. He's Paul to them people, so he's on their side. He's a great lad. He's one of us. But also, he uses he's an actor playing a part. So he's a, a you know, a, you know, it's, it's like Boyd Barrett. They're actors playing a part. They're playing the part of being socialists, but it's, it's just an act. It's a story. It's a performance. It's a script. It's a read through. That's all it is. And yeah, people are easily fooled by this. Some people are easily fooled by this. They also think that, like, if someone's a member of a small party, 
they're automatically on the side of the little guy, as opposed to a big behemoth political party. And that's absolutely not the truth anymore. Often these smaller parties that are deliberately funded, put into power, nursed and co op and uh, mollycoddled by the big parties as ways of getting policy they want to get through, through the alternative. So if they want to seize all our homes and stuff like that, well, the big parties don't do that, but they get the smaller parties and the independents to do that. And then that way it can never be, it, the paper trail never comes back to them. And so people have this autumn out oh, east for the little guy because he's a small party. No, the, they're usually they're working on behalf of the globalists under the guise of the smaller parties. And this is why these groups are very well funded. These individuals, you will never find a socialist TD, far left TD, or any kind of activist in Ireland that lacks any kind of money or funding. A lot of this will be channeled directly from globalist, uh, you know, NGOs and quangos and stuff like that, directly into this country and their coffers. Now, all you have to do is like, it's, a, it's the same old trick, isn't it? It's like, you know, the, the, when the whole left in this country, and I mean all of it, is basically at war with the working class uh, because they see us as, a, an, a, as an inhibitor to their globalization uh, because this is why they, will, they, they don't like the the natural strength of unity among working class people where families stick together and stuff like that. I hate that. So for they've used the welfare system for years to destroy families, you know, make women get, you know, their children's allowance and money that they don't have a husband at home. This has been going all over the world, not just in Ireland. But they've always hated the working class. And when you ever hear someone say far right or call someone far right, it's nearly always at a D4 type accent. And you'll find that the ones who set themselves up as the anti-racist this or anti-fascist that they're all from establishment families and and and, and they're driven by growing up sitting behind the taxpayer funded wall around our house looking at the commoners outside going i don't like them they're there they're not us and and instead of being in the establishment and the mainstream establishment when they grow up they become part of the alternative establishment and uh, the far left as you know whatever you want to call themselves and they seem to be against everything except paedophilia for some reason. But uh, then, then, then they go after the commoners because they also know that working class people, whether they're urban or rural, have a tremendous uh, drive to protect children. Yeah. They're a tremendous drive to protect children uh, because it comes from, in the past, that was the only way a really good family could survive was to make sure that should. So that's inherent in the poor. And so they've always wanted to destroy working class families. And so, and then working class communities. I mean, where's the refugee center in, in Dawkey? Where's mm. the refugee in Falls Bridge? You know? Now, I'm not putting down people, immigrants from overseas. I kind of understand, you know, where people want to make a better life. But don't, don't, don't play a game where you're using it to socially engineer your, your big agenda and then claim it's humanitarian when it's no such thing. You know, I, I mean, I often said if I won the Euro Lotto, the first thing I'd do is buy up a lot of properties in in, in Dawkey and give them as free houses to, to refugees and see, see how they... I mean, doesn't the head of the Irish Refugee Council live in the most expensive house in Ireland or most expensive street like Vico Road in, in, in Kalini or somewhere like that? I mean, it's just... Look, a, but that's, it, a, that's it, a whole... The, the whole charity NGO sector is... Um, it's a it's a rabbit hole you could go down and never come out of like there's so much corruption and dark dark politics dark agendas going on there we and again we're seeing it we're seeing it all over the place now with um the transgender stuff and you know the stuff going on in schools we have a problem now where um irish institutions that we didn't think we had a problem with like our school system like our university system that we thought okay it's okay we can we can we can leave our kids here and we can not worry about them that they'll be affected in a bad way now all that stuff is up for question like massively to be i want to play devil's advocate there with it a little bit though didn't the catholic church perform the same function in the past 100 oh, percent so, you know this whole thing that your children were always safe in school uh, you have to care you know there, there, there no, is like but, yeah, yeah, I, I get, yeah, I, yeah, I get, I get that, I get your point. I like, I do, I get that point. Um, but what I'm, I suppose, what I'm getting at is that 
the education system is a like the education system is a as it probably always was it's it's radicalized now into something else we'll say you could argue it was it was almost a tool to keep this country a kind of center right religious type of a country and now yeah, well, the catholic, catholic church have died a death a vacuum created and yeah. we've got progress we've got a radical progressive agenda that's ran railroad through it well this is another problem with the old scene in ireland they have to remember that the catholic church was another form of globalization and that's always yeah, going yeah. on in, in catholic churches and catholic schools so going going back to that is going back to a different form of globalization you know, yeah, so you yeah. have to, you said it perfectly. The Catholic Church, the one form of globalization, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Holy See collapsed in Ireland. There was a vacuum and it was filled in by globalization. But well, they're both the same thing. They're both yeah, they're yeah. both radicalized in different ways. The, the, the destruction of the, the national soul. Remember that. The ultimate desire yeah. of both Catholicism in this country and 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 uh and, and Christianity as a whole, and but particularly Catholicism because of its organizational structure. And uh, the globalization is the obliteration of the Irish self-identity. Always remember that. For those of you who are mauling the rosary beads and putting up pictures of tricolors next to Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary, you're missing the point completely because you're going to another, another a previous version of uh, globalization, not something new. Your religious faith and your religious belief is your own business, but don't be, don't be pushing that on the nation, on your tribal soul. Your tribal soul is something completely different. Your national ethnic tribal soul is something completely different altogether. Now, that's, that's another thing about the left and right thing, though, Jerry. One of the reasons they, put, they say far right, far right, far right is because they're desperately trying to keep the left-right paradigm going. It doesn't yeah, mean yeah, that yeah. anymore. Yeah, because yeah. some of my attitudes are right-wing. Sure. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I have been paying that penalty for pedophiles and things like that. Some of my other things are left-wing. Like, I'm totally in favor of gay marriage, and if there's a gay couple and they're decent yeah. people and they okay they can should be allowed to adopt, adopt children i have no problem with that I'm, I'm i'm like most of us in this scene i'm a mixed match of both of these things yeah, I, don't, yeah, yeah. I think ultimately the the, the 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 thing we should all strive for is human kindness and decency and that doesn't have a left or right you know winner yes. lose aspect it's just yeah. like what work what, what what will make life better for people now and i don't think you know drag queen story times necessarily makes life better for children it causes problems in communities and stuff like that, which is what it's designed to do. And it doesn't really serve the gay community at all. And it doesn't do anybody any favors. So the best thing is like, why even bother having it? And they say, if someone somewhere is trying to start trouble, someone somewhere is trying to find, oh, anyone is against it is far right. No, anyone is against it is just like, is this appropriate for little kids? That's not to do with the left or right thing. And the same thing on the other side. So. When, you know, you have to remember the only. We're probably a bit. Get, we're probably yeah. Go ahead. Real quickly, the only reason the left can remain in power is if the right exists, and the right doesn't exist. The far right doesn't exist. They have to make an imaginary version of it, and I don't see yeah. any far right in Ireland. I only see a delusional psychosis created by the far left and the mainstream left. Yeah, because they don't like a lot of these. Um, in a lot of these NGO, a lot of these people activists, NGOs, politicians, they don't exist without the enemy. The yeah. resin terror doesn't exist without an, with, without the enemy. So they, they have, like you said, they have to, if it isn't, the demand for far out, outweighs the supply of it um, yeah. in the country, like the, the way I, I look at it. Um, but that is, a, that's a very, because my own history to me in Ireland has always been, my view of the history is, we had an, an imperialist nation hand the country over to the Catholic Church is what happened, really. And we ran that system for 50 or 60 years and it fell apart. And now we're in this whatever we're in at the moment. But like I, I'm probably guilty, no more than what you say about using um, politicians first name. We're probably I'm, I'm probably a bit guilty of it as myself by rec by constantly recognize, you know, using their labels. Um, gives way to them, I suppose. Well, we're just using the syntax as descriptive more than actual philo philosophical, which is yeah, important. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. not actually we don't actually believe in that <laughs> stuff. But we, we'll, we'll, they say, but I think the ultimate arbitrary knowledge will always be like natural law. 
that you'll always subscribe to the idea of a natural process, that it's a natural, a natural equilibrium to everything in life, whether it be the universe, nature, us, or psychology, the lot, society. And that equilibrium can, can only be pushed out of balance so far before it collapses and moves to the center. And we saw that with the Rona. It became increasingly more and more ridiculous. Two masks, uh, blah, 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 worse and worse and worse. One vaccine, two vaccines, bang, it flows back to the center. So it's always, you'll always reach an equilibrium of, of natural law, uh, and no matter what the situation is. And the, the important thing is, is to just wait for that to happen while understanding the process and helping to move it back towards the center. And I think that's always the way I've tried to live. And that's the philosophy I think that works out quite well, regardless of what your background is, your class, your race, your religion. There's a, there's a fundamental element of natural law that exists within the universe, inside ourselves and inside society. And the balance is always to try to get that back. And that's the trajectory of history. History always swings back to the middle, no matter who takes in charge. Sometimes it goes to the other side too far, but then it always finds its equilibrium. And I think that was very apparent during the whole Rona thing, that we were we, that this thing is so unnatural, it's so stupid, it's so fake, it's so false, it's such it comes from a false dynamic that it, 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 a little nudge will move it back to the middle. And it happened. So I always remember yeah. that. Yeah, no, it did not like, and it happened quick, like it collapsed quickly. Like we'll say the the lockdown stuff, or the passports, that collapsed like really quickly. And when it when it you know, yep. the darkest, it, it it was true about like the um, the 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 hour before dawn is the darkest because it literally just overnight was gone. Um, before they said they were going to bring in mandatory passports, remember that? In fact, yeah, when yeah. they they said the mandatory the mandatory vaccination thing. That was the moment I knew it was over because that was their <laughs> last. That was the poker player playing his last hand. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't argue with there. You there? Um, well, look, Thomas, we've been rattling on for nearly an hour and forty minutes there. So it's been. Um, we might wind it up. Um, is there is there any any events you're involved with coming up, or any you know any stuff you want to um, talk about or promote? Uh, only in England on December 5th, I'm going to be talking about the spiritual aspects of the whole lockdown stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, when you strip everything down and all this, because of my own spiritual beliefs and everything, I totally agree, believe and know for a fact that some kind of dark spiritual force was actually behind all this. And this is why we're seeing the behaviors and politicians and people we even know they've changed overnight and you know you don't have to even believe there's a spiritual dynamic to the universe you can look at a kind of a cosmic horror kind of thing that this is a natural force and it's just playing itself out but the simple fact is we were encountered i know you believe this yourself jerry that we encountered something in spring 2020 that we were not ready for that was a unique experience on this planet and human beings have never experienced in this scale before so that was very much what you said what made us those of us who saw it for what it was, see it for what it was. I'm going to put it down to one thing. We still had an active soul. That's what our souls told us. And I totally, regardless if you're a Christian, a pagan, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, or an atheist, your soul was the ultimate arbiter and when you're coming to terms of what was really going on. Well, I think that's as good a place as we can leave it, Thomas. Well said. Okay, thank you. Um, not at all, not at all. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm just going to end it here, Thomas, but you can.